My name is Kelly Duncan. I'm president of the Audubon Commission. Thank you all for being here. Uh, first on the agenda is the approval of the minutes which have been circulated. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, do we have a second? All in favor of the minutes as written, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda is a presentation relative to the Good Work Network. And I would uh, ask Laurie Conkerton, if she would, to come up and make the presentation. Thank you, Kelly. This is actually a two-person presentation here. Um, Audubon is very committed to having diverse suppliers in our purchasing um, endeavors. And we work very diligently to try to have as many uh, suppliers from different parts of the community represented as possible. Um, in 2017, we spent t over 13% of our purchases were from minority, DBE, or women-owned business enterprises. So we really work hard to make sure we can um, increase that number every year. We spent over $4 million with diverse suppliers. Um, we have a partnership with a great organization in our community called the Good Work Network. Together with them, we bring together businesses that um, our own have diverse ownership for a variety of things. Everything's from painters, general contractors, geotech engineering services, marketing, catering, welding, electricians, the whole gamut of services. And we bring representatives of the businesses together with the people who make purchasing decisions at Audubon. And through this partnership, we've been able to stay on track of achieving our goal of 12% operational spend and 15 new diverse suppliers every year. Um, we have with us today the executive director of Good Work Network, Hermione Malone, and she's here to make a presentation to the commission. Thank you. So Good Work Network has been in existence uh, for 17 years, and in that time we've helped to serve uh, over 2,000 minority and women-owned entrepreneurs. And since we've started making really diligent efforts to connect uh, entrepreneurs in our community to opportunities with larger institutions like Audubon, we have seen $54 million in contracts awarded to those firms. Uh, and so we wanted to take an opportunity at our annual meeting uh, that we held last month to acknowledge partners in the community who've been really instrumental to that work. So on behalf of my board and staff, I'm happy to be here uh, representing Good Work Network and to present um, the following award. We have two levers driving our impact in our organization. One is our network of funders, um, and the other is our partners in programming in the community who believe in our work and who overcome institutional barriers to create openings to opportunity. We are thrilled to recognize Audubon for walking the talk uh, and have opened the door to not just opportunity, but to contracts and small business growth. Uh, to recognize this partnership, we created a new award this year called the Equity Ally Award. Uh, I have to call out Cecily Hallowell on the procurement team um, for her incredible partnership. Um, she is the hallmark of consistency. Uh, she's worked to bake equity into how she approaches her work for procurement, and as a result, we have seen true pathways to business growth. Um, so there are recurring small business presentations and meet and greets with procurement. In fact, we just had one last week. Um, and as you've heard, they have gone one step farther in establishing very specific goals for their organization organization. So it gives us great pride to present the 2018 Equity Ally Award to Audubon Institute. Thank you for your partnership, and I will just say that the award is a Terrence Osborne print that actually features one of the Audubon properties in it. It's the aquarium uh, that's there. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's a wonderful award indeed. I want to uh, make a little change in the agenda next on, on the agenda is the finance report. But um, given that we have uh, so many commission members here, and in case anybody has to run, I uh, don't want to get them while they're still here and go ahead and move up 
uh, the uh, master plan uh, discussion. So I would ask for a motion to amend the agenda to move the master plan items uh, before the discussion of the finance report. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, with that uh, said, I'd like to call on uh, Mark uh, Ripple to uh, provide a presentation uh, relative to the uh, master plan. And anybody who's been to any of our uh, four public meetings will know Mark, who has done a masterful job with this, no pun intended, of course. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we're going to try our best to compress six months of work and a hundred and something pages of master plan documentation into less than 10 minutes. So we're going to do it pretty quickly. Uh, as Kelly had mentioned, this, uh, we're at the culmination of a six month process uh, that has been purposely designed to be heavily, heavily uh, uh, community engaged at its, at its center and included four uh, community meetings over the course of that uh, six months. Uh, the master plan focus, we broke the, the park into three districts, starting at the right, uh, the area around St. Charles uh, Avenue, Exposition and Walnut, the area in the center with Magazine Street and that Magazine Street corridor with all of the challenges associated with it, and on your far left, uh, the Mississippi uh, Riverview uh, area. We specifically excluded the golf course and the zoo from this master planning effort. As many of you know, the Audubon Golf Course has been in place, has been in operation since 1898, and has been one of the fixtures here at Audubon Park since then, and it's considered, a, it has its own historic and aesthetic uh, legacy. Uh, the Audubon Zoo is in many ways not just an Audubon, but it's a city of New Orleans asset that has served over 800,000 visitors per year, and it is also subject to its own accreditation by the Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Uh, as we said, the community engagement process was central to this effort, and there were three basic components of it. Uh, the first was uh, surveys, uh, online uh, uh, surveys, where more than 1,000 respondents uh, plugged in their thoughts, their ideas, their concerns about what the park was and what the park might be. Uh, we also conducted intercept surveys for those perhaps that did not respond uh, uh, digitally online. Uh, we captured uh, folks that were using the park on a regular basis and captured their input. And then finally, a series of four very engaging, sometimes very spirited uh, community meetings where we listened, uh, we took notes, we shared ideas, we explored ideas, and we came to conclusions. Uh, we also incorporated a series of initiatives that happened between 2004 and 17. In 2004, unfortunately, there was a planning effort that was uh, halted due to Hurricane Katrina, but we built off of the, uh, the information developed at that time. And, and the master plan was, we started by saying, what is the mission of the Audubon Institute? What are the organizing principles? And how can we preserve, maintain, and enhance what the Audubon Institute is about, focusing on those principles? But the conversation quickly shifted in a little bit of a different direction. We recognized that our challenge was, to, and it was and still is, the fi to find the balance. And the balance is between active recreation on one side, which has been something that has been evolving since the park's conception in 1898, uh, and at the other end, passive relaxation. But similarly, there's a balance between the park now as seen in many ways as a 21st century town square, uh, that it is a, it's a cultural institution uh, as well, uh, and that that has to be balanced with this beautiful natural setting. So in the active versus passive, we explored what does that mean? It's not a series of black and white issues where it's either active or passive. It's a, it's a spectrum from one end uh, to the other. And through the master plan, we better understood that. And again, you know, as a, as a town square, as an area of gathering, of cultural exchange, that puts a whole different kind of set of pressures uh, on the park that perhaps didn't exist 120 years ago. What we concluded in this statement really represented the underpinning of everything that followed in the master plan, and it is stated as such, and I'm going to read it. 
the current balance, we believe, the master planners, that the current balance of active program space and passive open space is indeed appropriate as it currently exists. So the, the planning e uh, effort, uh, there were a lot of things revealed, folks that wanted to reduce or uh, squeeze back uh, programmed activities that already existed. There were others that wanted to expand it. We believe that that balance as, as currently exists is indeed appropriate. And then with that, we developed a series of very prescriptive uh, recommendations uh, to that effect, uh, 12 of which, and we'll touch on some of those, uh, we'll highlight some of those, we don't have the time to highlight all of them. One of the, the, the key issues was clarifying either misinformation or hearsay about just what was at the park. So we did an analysis using the survey data and calculating digitally what the acreage was. So in the master plan is the prescriptive information. I think this is 17 different categories. So the user, the, the park, the community can choose, for instance, to say that, well, the lagoon identified in M, uh, well, that's not really green space, it's blue space. Uh, that conversation can happen, but for the first time we can say uh, with confidence the lagoon is 11.6 acres. Uh, so with that, we did our conclusion, and again, I don't want to get into semantics, we spent a lot of time with semantics, but the way we interpret uh, the open space versus the program space, our, it's our conclusion that we have approximately 40% of the park is currently uh, open space with that lagoon item number M on the list. Uh, we looked in detail at programmed activities, and most notably, we spent a lot of time talking about tennis because there was so much advocacy in favor of tennis. In, in every one of the meetings, we had tennis representatives that said, this is a huge success, it's been in place for a long time, we'd like to exp sensitively expand it. Their recommendation was, can we do lighted tennis courts? This, of course, you can understand this, <coughs> excuse me, one second. You can understand this would be a perfect example where a neighborhood group would say, yes, but. That means lighting at night. It means people driving their cars perhaps at 9 o'clock at night rather than stopping at 6. What we concluded was that for tennis, this is the perfect opportunity to expand this community engagement process and use this tennis issue of whether or not the court should be lighted as the first opportunity to continue this process further, to drill down with the tennis advocates, with the neighborhood groups, and understand what is the right thing to do for the Audubon Institute. Uh, tr this says tree management. This is a much more expansive issue, uh, as was brought up in many of the, uh, of the discussions and in a couple letters that we received. First and foremost, we have this incredible natural resource that not just needs to be maintained, it needs to be uh, sensitively preserved for generations to come. Uh, that's an incredibly important endeavor. Uh, Audubon has been doing this for quite some time. They have a very robust tree management and preservation program. We took it a step further and said yes, but there are, for instance, instances, particularly out at the fly, where people are parking on tree roots. That is not a good idea. Yes, it fulfills a demand for people that want to park in a place that's convenient. Uh, the master plan specifically recommends that measures be taken to prohibit any further parking on tree roots. That can be done with bollards or it can be done in a natural way with landscaping, et cetera. So we do, are not just saying continue what you're doing, we're saying take it one step further and let's uh, do the right thing regarding the tree roots. Uh, we also enlisted because traffic was so much of a, a consideration. Uh, we brought in Urban Systems, one of the premier traffic uh, planning firms in the city, to help us study the traffic, particularly on the river side of the, uh, of the park. Uh, we looked at ways in which we might influence uh, the work that's being planned by the city of New Orleans for the improvements to Magazine Street, particularly at the entrances. Uh, those entrances can be very difficult and challenging, and we made specific recommendations that we hope they'll take into, take into consideration. We also looked at the way in which traffic flows at the river view and looked at ways in which that might be improved, rather than expanding, simply making what we have a little bit better. 
uh, specifically, we looked at intersections, but maybe more broadly, what we said, one of the underlying principles here was that uh, just continuing to provide more parking, more uh, vehicular access was not the right solution. The right solution is to provide viable alternatives for pedestrians and for people on bicycles. We had a bicycle advocacy group that's very willing, ready, willing, and able to help out find ways in which cyclists can, it can be a more cyclist friendly uh, campus. So we do think that's critical to the success of Audubon in the long term is finding ways in which we can get the balance between cars, people, and cyclists. Uh, drainage is a twofold condition. It is both a nuisance when you've got captured uh, standing water that produces mosquitoes after three or four days, but more importantly also it went in uh, issues of short-term flooding where it in, in fact affects adjacent properties. So we looked both at short-term incremental issues, but more importantly, we looked at sustainable issues, and we embraced strongly the City of New Orleans Urban Water Plan, which uh, attempts to get away from the idea that the solution in New Orleans is to put more pumps and more pipes and tear up the environment. You know, the beautiful thing here is that building off of the Olmstead legacy, the legacy was all about creating a natural environment that worked with nature rather than against it. So the green infrastructure principles that have been advocated by the city of New Orleans, in fact, do that. Let's find beautiful ways in which we can hold water. We have these wonderful lagoons. They're there for a reason, to be able not just as a beautiful natural asset, but also to capture water. So let's think more expansively over the long term about how we can embrace Green, natural green infrastructure initiatives to solve some of the chronic problems like drainage. We have a beautiful architectural uh, legacy uh, on the campus. And one of the, the uh, projects of particular note was Shelter 13. Uh, there was a lot of strong support for saving it. We embrace that, we support that idea, even though it's not a building that's on the National Historic Register. We do believe that it's of historic significance and it's worth trying to, to save. Uh, what was surprising is that in all of the effort, there was not any strong viable ideas about what we should turn it into. We know that there are challenges associated with returning it to its former function. And so our conclusion is, like the tennis courts, we recommend that this be the second deep dive, if you will, use another community engagement process to, to pull, draw out uh, ideas from the community and be able to rally support around a specific initiative for putting Shelter 13 back into use. Uh, there were a lot, uh, some of the things that come out are surprising. There was a lot of uh, discussion about what about the property, uh, properties that might be available, particularly along the riverfront. Wouldn't it be great if we could, in, in fact, expand uh, the Audubon Park footprint? And so we documented those, uh, and certainly, you know, open to ideas, as is the Audubon Institute, for how we might acquire those properties to make the park even better. Uh, so that wraps up the highlights of the master plan, but it, we, it, it was important that we also include the next steps and that last one. This public process, we consider it a success. We sincerely appreciated all of the input that we got uh, over the course of those six months, and we'd like, as we said, for the, both the tennis courts and for Shelter 13 to use a similar process to be able to draw out the best ideas from the community to be able to implement uh, some of the things in the master plan. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark. So today we're going to be considering um, a motion uh, relative to the uh, master plan. And, and Mark's frankly said a lot that I, I would have. Uh, this process has been a long one. And I really very much appreciate all the members of the commission who are here today, which almost everyone on the commission is here today, so that's tremendous and all of those who have been at the various public meetings, which have been so important in which the public has been so thoroughly engaged. Uh, this process has been going on for six months. It has uh, involved surveys to which 1,000 people uh, responded uh, online, as well as 500 in-person surveys. Uh, we've had, uh, through social media and news outlets, we've reached as many as 2.5 million people. Uh, it's really been a, a tremendous process and I'm one that I'm very proud of and I, and I hope my fellow commissioners are as well. 
Um, as as uh, Mark has talked about, uh, this plan that is being uh, considered today is one that reinforces our commitment to, the, to maintain the equilibrium between passive green space and space set apart for recreation. Um, I personally think this plan that uh, has been proposed very well does that. I would also add that like any strategic plan or master plan, this is a living document. Uh, it's one that we will go back and look at from time to time and revisit as to what has been uh, said in the plan as we move along. And I think it's important for everyone in, in the public to realize that. And I would also say that we encourage your continued input uh, relative to what Audubon does. I think this whole process has been so important to ensure that uh, people feel like they can get their uh, uh, feelings heard and, and uh, ideas heard and, and uh, that is something that I encourage you to continue to do. Um, now before we get public input I would like to go ahead and ask uh, for a motion to approve the Audubon Park Master Plan and adopt the recommendations set forth there and we have a motion second from uh, here from Deborah. Uh, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the, the motion, um, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, the motion is on the table, but we, my mistake, the motion's on the table, but I want to get public input before we vote, so I, I apologize. Got ahead of myself. It's been a long day. So, with that in mind, um, did we use cards? Yeah. Okay, so we have cards. I'm yep. going to let... Mark handle this. Okay, uh, and for those of you that I know m many of you were at the previous meetings, uh, simple rules. Uh, if you haven't submitted a card, please do so. Uh, you have two minutes uh, to speak, and at two minutes, we'll ring a bell, and just we'd like if you could complete your thought shortly thereafter. Thank you. Uh, the first to the mic is David Labresh. Is, it, okay. is this working? There we Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Now it's working. Now it's working. Yeah, I want to uh, say this is, the park is one of the real jewels of New Orleans, and uh, I appreciate all the work that y'all have done um, through the years. When I was back in the day, when I was in high school, we could play on Monkey Hill, but uh, it was, but it had a lot of issues. Um, and, you know, I mean, people come here to New Orleans, they go to the restaurants, but the favorite place of all my family that is scattered out is Audubon Park. They come back here, they love to walk, they love the blue, or not blue, lagoon, yeah. and the whole thing. I mean, it's, you know, and so, you know, I want to, it's, it's wonderful, and y'all are doing a great job in so many ways. Well, thank you. But it's like what I used to tell my wife about my weight. I said, we're not going to talk about that extra 10 pounds I put on it <laughs> in the last couple of years, because that's not part of the issue. Um, excluding the golf course is just not balanced. You, that's your favorite word, but you, it's not balanced. If you exclude a major part of the park, you're, you've defeated uh, your attempt to bring balance. And I know that's important to you. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the fact that there are a lot of people who really love the golf course here. Um, I see them, you know, there's a bunch of people right now golfing. But it really is a, a huge part of the park. And what I would ask you to do, because this issue has created so much animosity, which I think you people don't deserve because of all the work you've done for this park and um, for the city. I don't, th I don't think you deserve the anger that, that your exclusion of talking about the park has brought upon you. Um, and I really think that, I understand the park, that the golf course has to exist for a few more years because of state law or something, and that's fine. Okay, I'll finish in a second. Um, but at least let's talk about it so that in four years when it's free, you know, it, 
there could be changes. I think that would be, that would make all of y'all a whole lot happier. Because I know when you're out on the street, probably people give you grief. And if you don't hear it, I, I promise you it's there, okay? Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank and you, David. Keep, keep up your work. Thank you. Next up, Keith Hardy. Good afternoon, Keith Hardy, 618 Audubon Street. Uh, I'm also disappointed that the public was not allowed to weigh in on the future of the golf course and the zoo. No reasonable justification for that has been provided. I'm also disappointed that the master plan, plan's conclusion is that everything is just fine, thank you. This conclusion re fails to reflect the 40-year history of the loss of green space to pay-to-play land uses such as the golf course expansion, the zoo expansion, the clubhouse, and ball fields reserved for the children of the elite. I'm disappointed that Audubon hired SQ Ripple Dumas to do the master plan when the firm had no prior experience in master planning. I'm disappointed, but not surprised, that the planners reached the Pollyannaus conclusion that everything a that a and I had done to the park is just fine, which is exactly what a and I wanted to hear. Once again, the commission has allowed a and I to push aside the public, while the tourism industry, which dominates the a and I board, designs parks for tourists and not for residents. What we have is the continued gentilization of our parks, emphasizing privatization and calling for parks to pay for themselves, even if that means giving up green space needed by residents to restaurants, lazy rivers, and entertainment venues. Like the illegally funded millage campaign, the fiasco in which library funds were transferred to the Nojo Orchestra, and controversies over the golf course and soccer fields this is not a moment that this commission should celebrate. Thank you, Keith. Next up, Ann McKinley. Good evening. I'm glad to hear that there are currently no plans to further develop the green space in Audubon Park. I know I speak for many citizens when I say that I will look forward to seeing the park receive much needed maintenance and upkeep of its green spaces and restoration of historic structures. However, there is no logic in excluding the zoo, golf course, and Audubon Tea Room from the master planning process. They are a large part of the land and of the taxpayer funding that goes into the park's budget. Indeed, the commission itself has argued that these fee-based activities are an essential part of the park's mission and funding to the extent that the funding for the park upkeep is buried in the golf course clubhouse budget. To wit, the Audubon Nature Institute asserted today in a response to a Save the Fly Facebook post that it is the paid activity fees that support and rationalize the green space in the park. If we accept this assertion from the ANI, it seems to me to underline the cohesive nature of the park and the need for a master plan that incorporates all aspects of park management, including the zoo, the golf course, and the tea room. The master plan should cover all of Audubon Park, not just the fringe of remaining green space. The question at issue here is not whether or not you enjoy golf or approve of golf courses, zoos, or tea houses. It is a matter of public trust. It is the use of public money to support enterprises that are only open to those members of the public who can afford them. It is the lack of public input on the majority of public space. Audubon Park is paid for with taxpayer dollars and administered by a body of commissioners who are not elected by the citizens. As such, its budget should be clear and open. Park maintenance should not be hidden in a catch-all category. Public input should not be arbitrarily limited by the commission to only a fraction of the park, and a complete and open master plan should be enacted. Whatever your position, I urge you to contact your city council and your mayor. Let them hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. 
Next up, Deborah Howell. Hi. Um, well, I agree with the previous speakers about leaving out the golf course and the zoo makes the master plan somewhat hollow. Um, but there's another big glaring omission in this master plan, which is any discussion of finances and funding. Um, there's one page out of the 95-page document which alludes to funding, but I took a look at the city park master plan, which is on its 2017 iteration, and it's a 22-page document, and they have three whole pages talking about finances, funding, and numbers. And I think that's a very glaring omission in this plan. Your, the property tax millages that Audubon receives currently expire in 2021 and 2022, and we have no clue what you all plan to do about funding or replacing those deficits. And a lot of people would really like to know and sort of had hoped that the master plan might provide some direction that you all were thinking about to deal with this issue that's coming up in the next few years. So again, it's a, it's a lovely looking plan, but it has glaring omissions and they need to be fixed. Thank you, Deborah. Next up, Shirley Laska. My name is Shirley Laska. I'm a disaster recovery specialist <clears throat> for the last three decades, um, teaching, research, and applied work. I want to also thank you for all the effort that you have in invested in this plan. It, I, it's critically important. And I would like to follow on the comments uh, that my previous uh, speaker talked about with regard to funding. I would like to uh, refer to Mr. Duncan's uh, phrase that this is a living document. One of the ways in which uh, Dr. Becker at City Park has been successful in recovering the park to the extent that they have done so since, the, uh, since Katrina, recovering it in a way that is stunning. And I value this park, and I'm, I live in it all the time, so I'm not doing a comparative uh, conversation. I bring many, many people from out of the city to listen to Mr. Becker's representation of how he has succeeded. And every time he tells the same story, it's the master plan. The quality of the master plan, the livingness of the master plan, is the way in which the funding for the park is achieved. Because when a prospective donor comes in, he whips out the master plan for those projects that have not yet been done, and of course they've been shrinking, and he shows them what they could do. And it's very interesting how sometimes a person comes in and wants to do, he thinks they should have done the symphony lawn, and they turn out to do the, the tennis courts. But he has a designer who takes that element of the plan and puts it into a presentation, much like Mr. Ripple just, just did. And um, there it is, there's the funding. So there's a lot of reasons for having a master plan, and the quality of the content so that funding can be achieved when we have our next hurricane, it's not if, it's when, is I think a very critical goal that I hope you all thought about and as it, this plan evolves, that you seriously think about the use of the plan for funding. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Caroline Center, Center. Hi, I'm Caroline Center. I'm a native New Orleanian. I, um, I'm sorry I, I, um, I was late. I, I have an enormous oak tree in front of my house and I had someone coming by to look at how to prepare it for hurricane season. Um, but I had a hard time sh finding a shady spot to park out there. And I thought that was kind of symbolic because that's how I feel about What's hap what I've seen go um, Ottoman Park go through throughout my whole life. Um, I grew up with Monkey Hill, and I thought, I didn't see any problem. We thought it was extraordinary. We rode our bikes down it, and it was a hill, you know? <laughs> it was a dirt hill, and um, otherwise, we'd have to, like, go away to summer camp to find something like that. So th we thought it was incredible, and um, I think children need those kinds of things. I raised two kids here. Um, they need to see unstructured um, nature, un, you know, 
free and structured space. And um, there's less and less of that. You know, one of my favorite things also used to be going up on the levee. Well, I can't really go up there and sort of meander around, get lost in my thoughts because I'm going to get run over by any, you know, by, I, know, I know everyone loves the bike trail, so I, I know that no one's going to agree with me on that, but I, I like to go up there and kind of get it spaced out and, and not worry about my life. But, you know, I just feel like um, I did walk in when the speaker was speaking about the ecological aspects of the park, and I don't see how a forward-thinking master plan, which is a master plan, is can include a golf course. It's not. That's in the future. It's not going to be there. So I just think that it has to be in the, in the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Richard Carrier. Thank you. I enjoyed you talking about the water plan and how it's going to be ideally very holistic. And in fact, I, I think I mean, ideally, you would be initiating steps soon that aren't redundant, that are part of that holistic plan. I happen to meet a gentleman, which maybe some of you know. He's from Amsterdam. He's in Amsterdam tonight. I communicated with him today. And he put together his observations. He's a water specialist. Uh, he was one of the two specialists that spoke at the Greater New Orleans Foundation on May 24th about well, the, the program was titled Living on Thick Water. That's New Orleans. I thought the presentation by both gentlemen was excellent, and it may be able to be observed online soon, if not now. But I'm going to have to shorten this. There's a lot that I have here. And he, uh, he also mentions, the, in fact, he's part of the process. He worked with Jess Hebert, Jeff, Jeff Hebert, who was the, uh, mm -hmm. the chief, chief uh, what do you call it, <laughs> officer, the resilience, resilience officer, officer for the of city Orleans. of New Orleans until a few right. months ago, and they actually succeeded in getting, I think, a $140 million mm -hmm. grant from the yes. Rockefeller Foundation. Yes. So he's been coming in and out of the city for years now, and he's very good at observing. So if I wanted to see where my roof leak was and it's a rainy day, I might go in the attic and look for the leak. Well, he does that on his weekends if it's raining. He goes to places he hasn't looked at yet, like Audubon Park, and sees what he can find. So I'm going to read some of what he shared with me. During a rainy Sunday, I observed that most of the stormwater, he's talking about Audubon Park, okay, um, from areas with natural vegetation, as well as from the main lagoon, discharged into the urban drainage system. That is, below St. Charles Avenue. I also observed an unpleasant surface water quality with rotting debris, and I measured a relatively high salinity. He carries a salinity meter with him. I assume that the brackish situation is related to recharge by groundwater pumping. I also saw what appeared to be a well near the golf course shop, yet this needs to be clarified needs confirmation. At that moment, after reading the master plan, it was and remains unclear that the water system of the public part of the park, golf course, Audubon Landing, sports field, and zoo are connected to each other. So I'm going to skip some yeah, parts. Now. I'm going to hand these out to, okay. to a few people. Uh, okay. I'm just kind of writing about, he, he, okay, here we go. Is it realistic to produce a park master plan without considering the basic planning layer, water system, soil, and subsurface? Drainage from the park into the urban drainage system impacts the risk for urban flooding as well as the water quality of Lake Pontchartrain. The water quality should be improved not by adding extra oxygenation techniques, I think we know what those are, but by reducing the causes such as from reducing the fertilizers, uh, reducing, if there are, pesticides. Richard, I'd ask you to I'm wrap about up. Kind of, I'm about be Please. For, you know, reduce ground, uh, to, to capture the groundwater, to be sure you don't release dredged material, and making use of additional working with nature solutions. Solutions and okay. should, uh, design should be integrated in the park area as a whole. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, Holly Rock. 
Oh, I'm sorry, grow. Sorry. Hi, I I'm a physician mom that, and our family lives back by the Tree of Life. We love Audubon Park. I have concerns, though, over the privatization that seems to be occurring. For instance, this weekend, the movie crew was there when I went to dunk the dogs in the the um, fountain nearby. I was told by a woman that she had rented it um, and blocked off the area, and then the labyrinth had a spacewalk set up by it and balloons. And I'm very interested in the health of our community, our children, and um, to me, the park should be for everyone. I was very much an advocate of keeping the soccer fields as a green space, even though I did my residency at a children's hospital, and my kids are, our, our kids are on the Carrollton boosters. I believe the park should be for everyone, that we should all be able to use it to unwind, and um, I hope that you have addressed that in your master plan and kept that in mind because um, we're seeing effects on our daily walk around that um, look like it's been privatized. The other thing I wanted to ask you all too is to the food trucks that make all the noise on the weekend. It's hard to have your private moments in the park when you have um, the generators going and I hope that was addressed too. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Grace Hill. Hi. I'm just going to read this. The writers of the draft master plan are also careful t to discuss balance only in terms of land use and not people use. The zoo and golf course together take up 44% of the land in Audubon Park, but certainly don't attract 44% of the park's users. At any time of day, but especially at peak use times in the morning and evening, the masses of park users squeezed onto the biking, jogging track that circles the golf course, number in the hundreds, while the vast, by comparison, golf course draws much fewer, balance hardly. Quoting from the May 2nd letter, of the National Association for Olmsted Parks. Before adopting a master plan for Audubon Park, we urge that those participating in its creation pause and fully consider the underrepresented elements of park heritage and physical landscape characterization. In particular, NAOP recommends that before continuing, a heritage landscape report be generated by a qualified professional with experience in historic landscape rehabilitation and that its results be formative in shaping the final master plan. Audubon Park and the people of New Orleans stand to benefit from a more inclusively conceived plan. It can likewise elevate the national prominence and foster future integrity of this special heritage landscape. Speaking to this letter, I request deferral of this master plan until there is sufficient public awareness and input. There are too many unanswered questions about the appropriateness and viability of the golf course, which has already been significantly expanded beyond its original boundaries without public input and violating Olmsted's unique and irreplaceable design. As far as the zoo is concerned, at the very least, the public needs to have a clear idea of its financials. In light of the outcry against the 2016 millage increase, we have a right to know exactly what is happening with this half of the public park that is not free and open and was not in Olmsted's original vision of the park. 
as well as with the large chunk taken up by the fenced off private sports venues on the fly. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Justin Cray. Thank you. Justin Cray. Uh, good afternoon, Commission. Uh, thanks for hosting this session. Yeah, my name is Justin Cray, urban planner, uh, park advocate, president of the City Park for Everyone Coalition, which fought the golf course in City Park um, in 2015. Um, I just wanted to uh, present as sort of myself as somewhat as some of the figures, uh, doing some of the map work behind some of the open space figures that advocates we're working on coming up with on our own. Uh, was thankful to finally have a meeting with SQ Dinas Ripple on and with some of the documents we received, adjusted our figures up to 35%. I just wanted to talk for a second about so what I see is the discrepancy between the 44% and the 35%, which largely has to do with when you discount all the areas that are used for parking. Um, automotive uses in the park actually take a much larger share of the park use than I think is actually recorded in the master plan. And I think that's an important thing to document. Um, I see the transportation uses taking up approximately 14% of the park space, which is significant. I mean, given the master plan we're talking about is really roughly only talking about 50% of the park, 14% is actually, if you think about 14% relative, that's about 33% of the master planning process area we're talking about. Um, this includes surface area parking lots, overflow, areas between bollards where people can legally park and all of the river roads coming around, um, sort of where the tree of life is. A lot of the areas that are kind of could be considered potential revenues if I actually think one of the things that many people have talked about here is the financial issues of this master plan. And one of the things I think you could look at is the money that could be gained from charging for parking. I think it's been well documented that parking, free parking does not necessarily create optimal land uses. And I'm, not, I'm kind of surprised that there hasn't been a discussion of maybe building a parking structure or some way to offset all of the parking that dominates so much of the, the fly and all of the areas within the park south of Magazine Street. Um, I think that another important connection for the financial piece that this master plan should consider is the millage renewal, which will likely happen in the next four years. And that's within the near term future. So I think if it's a living document, that should, I would just encourage the commission to consider that either maybe internally and working to make that a financially transparent document so that the public feels encouraged to vote in favor of a millage renewal. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, any further, it's the last card I have, any further comments? Okay, thank you. All right, I'll try to get this procedure right this time. <laughs> so, a motion has been made by, I believe, Brent Wood and seconded by Deborah Harkins to approve the Audubon Park Master Plan and adopt recommendations set forth therein. I'd like to open the floor to discussion by members of the commission. You've heard a lot today. Uh, does anybody have any comments, questions, discussion? Ron? Yes, sorry. Um, I, I'll just briefly, I'll just say I, I thank everybody for coming and, and the comments they made, I'm uh, inclined to to be s at least empathetic to the, the idea that there may not be a, a, f a good financial picture in the master plan of what is what we have looking forward for the park. I think that's going to be a critical uh, deliberation with in light of the renewal, the Miller's renewal uh, issue that will come up very soon. Um, I will, though, say that I think it was a job well done, and I hope that the commission takes it seriously that this is a living document, and at that point when we start to discuss those things, that it does get incorporated, the, the financial picture of the park, into, uh, into the master plan for further, further discussion. So uh, with that said, that would be my, my comment. Thank you. Very good comments. Others? Deborah? Uh, I'd like to ask the applicant, how are we? I'm going to turn that over to, to Ron, please. I think the clarification 
Yeah. The question relates to the incorporation of discussion of, of financing and as one of the other speakers talked about funding, what we're talking about in the master plan and how whether that how that should be incorporated in the plan. First, first and foremost, the commission and the Auburn Nation Institute gets monthly statements, um, does financial reports, we have a treasurer, we have a finance committee, we have an audit committee, uh, numbers are looked at, and we actually in the meeting today, we deferred the financial report so we could have this public meeting, and those who want to stay, there will be a financial report given that gives you status of each of our facilities, broken down by um, all revenue, all expenses, and share where we are. We are in good financial shape. We are in strong financial shape. The issue of finances, we've been doing this for six months now in public meetings. We've had, what was a 1,000 people interacted with questions. We had 500 people in a survey. The issue of financial issues was not an issue that came up in a issue of importance into the last couple of weeks. Um, and so I share with you, I share with you that um, in the master plan, we listen to the public. What are your issues? The biggest issue we heard over and over again was the balance of open space to recreation space. Most of the time, and you can see from the studies, dealt with the issue, any more recreation, any more green space, and that's where the majority of time was spent. Um, we'd be glad to share anything with the finances. The issue of the millage has been brought up. Of interest, the millage, not a penny of the millage goes to Audubon Park. The millage goes to the zoo, and it goes to the aquarium. Audubon Park, much like City Park, but not completely like City Park, does not get direct public money to operate Audubon Park. When you start talking millage, that's something we want to talk about in the future. Audubon Park should be part of the millage. We shouldn't have to rely on finding a way to cut the grass, or trim the trees, or pick up the trash by generating revenue. Just a matter of fact, if you want a clean park, and we're clear and happy with the response we got from all the public surveys on the condition of the facilities, but that's paid for from self-generated revenue. It's not paid for by, um, by the millage. So we will address the millage before we go back to the voters. Um, as our chairman said, this is a living document. Issues like tennis courts, the issue of the roadway is going to be part of more future public meetings. The issue of the golf course uh, could be part of future meetings. This document will be reviewed every five years. Um, it's a chance to go back and review all our issues. I do need to speak, though, as the person that, that leads the effort for the management group with a contract with the commission, that when you talk the priority of some people, which has been very few, about should we consider the zoo and the golf course as part of this process. Um, the zoo, the zoo's been here over 100 years, 110 years. The cost of replacing the zoo would be about $200 million. Visitation of the zoo is almost a million people. Uh, the education, conservation, the, the quality of life, the branding of our city with the zoo, is ranked in the top five or six of the country. So talking about replacing the zoo with some other use just not come out in a lot of discussions until recently. The golf course is, was the year 1890, 1898 the golf course was built. And guess who was part of the planning process for the golf course? The Olmstead firm was part of a golf course. Over 120 years, the golf course has been there. The golf course was restored about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, whatever the time period is. Uh, a lot of public money went in at that time to redo the golf course. Um, I'm not sure what the bias is one way or the other for the golf course with the general public. We've heard from some golfers, 30,000 people play golf. We heard from some people saying golf course is not the best use. That might be part of a process when we look to the future. Um, for the golf course, but both the zoo and the golf course are historical parts of our city of New Orleans that both have heavy usage by a lot of people and um, for good reasons have been kept out of this process to this point. 
and the issue that we addressed more than anything else in the process was land use and green space opposed passive space opposed to recreation space. Those who want to stay for the rest of the meeting will be talking finance in much more detail. Thank you, Ron. That was, that was a great explanation. Other questions? Yeah, Pam. Well, as, as Mark talked about, that's very much an important part of this plan. And, and water management, um, as uh, Richard Carrier was talking about earlier, is something that the city has been focused on ever since Hurricane Katrina. Jeff Bear was a great uh, advocate on behalf of the city about that. And uh, uh, whether it's Wagner and Ball and other law f uh, ar architectural firms have been so involved in that. And, and that's something that uh, Audubon certainly um, has a, a, a significant priority in this plan and, and, uh, and certainly embraces that as being very important. Other questions, comments of the board, of the commission? Okay, well, we have then, uh, the motion has been made to approve the Audubon Park master plan and adopt the recommendations set forth therein. Uh, I would ask uh, all who are in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you all very much. Next on the agenda, uh, and please stay because it's finances for those of you who are interested. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Laurie Conkerton to talk about the financial report. We're going to go through this with a presentation to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, I don't know what I need to do here. <laughs> okay, that looks better. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to go through our financial um, statements through May 31st this year. And as Ron said, we are looking really good from a financial standpoint. Our net revenue totals right now $5.7 million. That's 39% ahead of what we had budgeted, 2% lower than last year. You have to keep in mind that the Nature Center has been open for an entire year now, and our project on the West Bank with the San Diego Zoo Global, the Alliance for Sustainable Wildlife, that's been open for an entire year. Last year, those projects were not open at the same time, so that's why we're running a little bit ahead, uh, a little bit below last year on the net. Our year in target for the, the whole year is $381,000. And you'll see some numbers here, and you're going to think that's kind of an amazing number because that is less than 1% um, net on, on our revenues. We are a seasonal business. Like every zoo in the country, we rely on our busy season to make positive net revenue. And there's only five months out of the year when that happens. We're in that season now, if you haven't noticed, um, both at the aquarium and at the zoo. This is our time of tremendous visitation. That's a real important thing for us. All of our facilities' nets exceeded their budget for the period from January 1st through March, uh, May the 31st this year. Um, so we are at our time where we are maximizing our revenue for the year. Total revenue through May was $26.1 million. That's 1.6% lower than budgeted. That's sort of timing. Some things were budgeted to come in earlier than they actually have been. Um, 
the revenue is 1% greater than the 2017 actual um, numbers. Our year in target is $53.1 million. We are on track to achieve these goals for this year. Attendance is the number one thing that we look at when we're managing our budget because attendance related revenue is, accounts for 63% of all revenue for Audubon. 33% of our revenue comes from admissions, 19% from food and beverage and retail, and 11% from membership. So that all depends on people coming through our doors. Through May 31st, we had 936,000 guests at all of our facilities. We are a very weather dependent business, especially here at the zoo. As of Sunday, this past Sunday, we were up to over a million visitors, a million ninety-four thousand at the zoo, aquarium, nature center, and um, I'm sorry, the um, the butterfly garden and insectarium. Um, so we're pretty much on target for our, our attendance numbers for the year. Um, Oh, I just wanted to point out that the remainder of our budget, in case you're wondering, 8% is from millage, 9% is from our catering operations, 13% is from recreation, such as the golf course fees and the um, tennis fees, public relations as well. And then the balance is a transfer from the institute and the foundation. So that's money earned on our endowment or funds raised for specific purposes, like an education program or underwriting a, a, a uh, special kind of program. Our self-generated revenue accounts for 92% of the budget. So keep in mind, that's why all of these opportunities for generating revenue are so important to maintaining our mission. We look at admissions revenue. We had 8.3 million as of May 31st. That's 3% greater than budget, 1% greater than um, last year's actual. Our year in target, 17.7 million. So we're right on track for that. Um, I think one of the reasons why we have a greater than, uh, greater than we had budgeted is because we have more general admission visitors coming than we had originally projected. And keep in mind, earlier this year we did have to close for a couple of days due to the freeze when the city shut down. So that definitely impacts our revenue, but we still are managing to be ahead of the game. Our tax millage revenue in the operating budget, we are allocating $4 million this year. 3.6 million for the aquarium in downtown, and that's spent according to how the budget lang the bu uh, ballot language read, and 400,000 is allocated to the zoo. This is 11% lower than last year. One of the things that we are doing, recognizing fully that the millages will be expiring shortly, is we're reducing the amount contributed to the operating budget by $500,000 a year. We started this process in 2016. By 2021, we'll be two and a half million dollars less contributed to the operating budget from the, the millage. And that's a real important thing for us to be doing. Um, as I mentioned, the millage accounts for 8% of the total operating budget. And as Ron said, and I'd like to reiterate, the zoo millage is specifically for the zoo. It does not support the park, it supports the zoo. So just wanna make sure you're aware of that. Um, the part that would have gone to the operating budget, as we had previously, that's going into maintenance and, and, and improvements of our facilities. So you see some things happening at the aquarium, like it helps buy a, a new chiller for the air conditioning system. At the zoo here, it's for some maintenance projects. Our total expenses um, through May were $20.4 million. That's 9% lower than budgeted. Uh, it's also 2% greater than last year, as I mentioned. That's because we have the um, ASW and the Nature Center projects open. Our year in target is $52.7 million in expenses. Um, the reason that we're looking good compared to budget is we ha are very, very carefully monitoring all of our expenses. Um, the revenue departments, if they're not doing as well, they can reduce labor, they can reduce cost of goods, but everybody is staying on top of their expense budget. Our salary expenses is one of the biggest contributors to this. We are a very, very labor intensive type of organization. It takes a lot of hands to cut the grass and to feed the animals and take care of the animals um, and to just provide all of our services. So our salary budget, um, our salary is at $10.1 million, which is 10% less than budgeted, 1% greater than last year because of the two other projects, the Nature Center and the ASW. Year and target, target is $26.6 million. Um, 
the, another a reason why we are low on our salary expenses, other than keeping a close eye on it, is we are monitoring overtime very closely. Our overtime is 21% less than budgeted and less than last year. We also had positions that might have been identified and budgeted for the whole year, but they haven't been filled yet. So we are uh, filling those positions as the budget allows. Um, net contributions from some of our major revenue departments. Membership budget, memberships running ahead of budget in last year, $2.8 million net from membership. That's 6% higher than budgeted and 4% greater than last year. Um, and that has to do with solicitation timing and turning cards around really quickly and they're just doing a really great job on their operations. Our food and concession operations, they're at $505,000 net, it's 11% less than budgeted, but 23% higher than last year. Uh, we've implemented some inventory control systems, tightening up on a lot of systems, and we're seeing some great improvements from our concessions arm. Gift shops down uh, is $880,000 net. It's 4% lower than budget, but 7% higher than last year. Um, they had a very aggressive net budget, and that was due to some virtual reality project at the aquarium that they're managing. Um, the costs are exceeding what we had expected initially, but that's all falling into line now. They're um, straightening that out. Our special events netted $318,000. Now, this one is below budget and below last year, 26% below budget, 32% below last year. We've had a major reorganization in our special events department um, at the leadership level, and we have some new projects that are underway with um, our special events. Overall, we are on track for a great year. Um, we need to get through the summer months before we say, yes, absolutely, we're having a fantastic year. We need to get through hurricane season, bad weather, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'll say absolutely, we're doing great by the time we get to October, but we're on track for a really good year so far. So that's our finance report. Any questions? Okay, turn it over. We don't need that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Laura. That was a tremendous report, and I hope it answered some of your questions, I know it didn't answer all, but um, I, as you can see, the, the Audubon Institute is in very good shape. Um, we're getting to the end of this meeting, but before we, we close this meeting, I, I want to thank um, the Eskew Dumez Ripple firm for all their hard work and, and the people they brought in to assist with the master plan. And I also want to thank the, the incredible uh, Audubon staff. I mean, the the ability of, of uh, Mark and his team to do what they did as a function of, of having great Audubon staff and being able to work with them and get, get their input and, and really make this a, a very thorough uh, uh, plan, uh, notwithstanding some of the comments perhaps made today, but one that gave a lot of thought and that will definitely improve everyone's experience at the park going forward. And lastly, I again want to thank my fellow commissioners for all of their input and involvement in this planning process. It's really been important. It's been, uh, obviously, uh, we've had some significant meetings, well attended, and it's, it's been great. And, uh, and actually, lastly, what I want to do again is encourage all of you to provide, continue to provide your input. We want your input. We, we welcome it. And uh, please, don't stop. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All in favor of adjourning? Motion carries. Thank you.